Long, long time ago, at least a few decades ago, the postal system was modernized, made more effective, restructured, again restructured, and then made even more effective. As is always the case with such well-planned undertakings, they started and ended in utter chaos, and some post offices were overlooked. The postmaster general looked high and low to find the neglected post offices and relentlessly modernized them until he finally leaned back to look at a task well done and congratulated himself on having successfully done away with the old world charm of what used to be the post office. Or so he thought. In truth, he had still overlooked two tiny offices, one tucked away in the rolling hills of Somewhere, and the other at an inconspicuous corner of a rather quiet residential area somewhere in London. Several decades later, these two post offices gave up waiting for their modernization to happen and continued with their uneventful but happy lives. Meanwhile, the world changed and people no longer sent letters and the post offices mainly handled boxes and bills. Until one day, when the quiet daily routine of both of our post offices was to be violently disrupted. London's most infamous socialite, Lady Susan, the most accomplished coquette in England, had taken to letter writing after having been the object of a full-blown social media scandal. Something to do with the Lord Mannering, the tabloids wrote. To the delight of some of the staff, Lady Susan's letters all needed to pass through either or both of our post offices. And they were eagerly expected because the secrecy of the letter really isn't what it used to be. Let's meet the staff of the Churchill post office in Somewhere close to Far Wayington and small town upon Stour. This post office is situated conveniently close to the country manor of Lady Susan's family-in-law, the Vernons. Their home is called Churchill and the family, especially Mrs. Vernon, has always been a big letter writer and corresponded extensively with her family. The local post office is run by postmistress Cecily Clark, 54, and a very private person who hates sharing personal information about herself. Because of that, she really doesn't understand why anybody would choose to share sensitive info through a medium other people might have access to. Despite being a postmistress in one of the most old fashioned post offices in the entire world, Cecily is very tech savvy and likes all sorts of modern technology and secretly bears a grudge towards the postmaster general for having failed to modernize her post office. So to get back at the postmaster general in some weird way, she allows her staff to filch Lady Susan's letters, even though she herself is hardly interested in the scandal at all. Meet postwoman Janice Norton, 39, married, no children, who loves her job as a postwoman, meeting all villagers and being out of doors most mornings. As an ideal postwoman, she's not very interested in gossip or other people's secrets, which makes her the perfect person to tell all your secrets to. Despite herself, Janice slowly begins to take an interest in the letters the post office intercepts, but would, of course, never admit to that because she really isn't that interested in them. Second postman, Michael Hardcastle, 29 and engaged to be married. Michael takes his work very seriously and is what people call a good and upstanding member of society with one vice. He loves to gossip. Of course, he tries to hide that, but all of his colleagues know anyway. When he isn't taking long bike rides in the Churchill countryside, his second most favorite pastime, he eagerly awaits the arrival of new letters 
while making tea that is way too strong for his colleagues at the office. Here, you cannot see Julia Marie Clerkenwell. That's because Julia Marie has been deeply suspicious of modern technology since her parents were victims of cybercrime. So she refuses to make an appearance anywhere on the internet. The recent scandal of Lady Susan just about confirmed all of her deepest fears. Still, just because she doesn't want to be the victim of cybercrime doesn't mean that she can't have a bit of fun with the misfortunes of others. However, she doesn't feel too comfortable about reading other people's secrets, so she's somewhat conflicted, but, uh, well, what can you do? Cousins Catherine Thorpe and Isabella Moorland, both 17, rather typical teenagers and post office apprentices. Catherine is a natural leader and tends to cause trouble for herself and her cousin, while Isabella is rather quiet and introverted. Both love a good gossip, but where Catherine revels in scandal, Isabella would never admit to it. Catherine is mainly bored by her job at the post office, so she also eagerly awaits letters. Isabella is as eager for the letters, but not because she's bored by her work, which she actually likes, but because she has been infatuated with Lady Susan from the start. Both girls rather often volunteer to read the letters to their colleagues to make sure they get them first. Meet letter sorter and near pensioner Jacob King. Jacob is a very quiet and contented gentleman who is at peace with himself, the world and all the people in it. The most important people in his life are his two grandchildren and his colleagues whom he cares for like the lovely granddad he is. Unlike his younger colleagues, Jacob is hardly interested in the letters and only reads them if nobody else can to keep the lovely people at the London Post Office updated. Like Postmistress Clark, he is somewhat disappointed at the Postmaster General for having forgotten the Churchill office. But, as Jacob says, there is certainly a reason for everything. Now let's see who works at the London Post Office. The local postmistress at the London office is Mrs. Patricia Khan, 58, married with two children at college. Patricia is very well liked by her staff because she's a genuinely lovely lady and cares a lot for her staff. Sometimes, however, she annoys them a little, only in a good way, of course, because she is just the nosiest person that ever existed. When she read about the Lady Susan scandal in the papers, she even forgot to question her stuff about their private lives for a day. Much to her own regret, Patricia never managed to use a computer very well, and the gossip-filled social media platforms the papers write about are only a fairy tale to her. Imagine her delight when she read that Lady Susan had decided to leave social media and take to more traditional forms of communication. Meet Thomas Ford, 31, widower and single father of a daughter in kindergarten. Thomas is a mild-mannered and quiet-spoken man and everyone's ideal colleague. The only thing he loves more than his work at the post office is his daughter, Daisy, who occupies his every thought. On his daily tours round the neighbourhood, he would always check in on her to make sure her grandparents take good care of her. Even though Thomas would like to be interested in the letters, he is afraid that doing so might make him a bad role model for his daughter. But then again, Lady Susan is a mother too, and she at least impressively demonstrates what a bad parent would be, right? Right? According to her wife, postwoman Sandra Tay, 42 with one adopted daughter, is the primmest and properest person in England. And indeed, Sandra really likes adhering to rules. She genuinely thinks it's wrong to read other people's letters and tries to discourage her colleagues from opening Lady Susan's letters. To no avail, of course. It's not that she wants to spoil her colleagues' fun, but she wants to protect them from wrongdoing and is distressed when they don't mind her. Still, to keep the peace, especially with postmistress Khan, 
Sandra reluctantly reads some of the letters if she really cannot help it. But mind you, she does not like it at all. Brilliant but defiant, Helen Cho, 37, adopted daughter of a Chinese diplomat, is the rebellious spirit of the London Post Office. Even though her parents are the loveliest and nicest people and have only ever supported her in anything she did, Helen strongly roots for Frederica and Reginald, who are both suppressed and bossed around by their parents, says Helen. Having experienced a loving childhood herself, Helen finds herself well equipped to sympathize with them, a paradox her colleagues have pointed out repeatedly. While not generally interested in gossip, Helen eagerly awaits the letters to find out more about the tyranny of the de Courcys and Lady Susan. Finally, meet the hopeless romantic of the London Post Office. Marianne Brandon, 19, deplorably single and a bit of a tragic case. After having had to drop out of school to earn money for her romantically impoverished family, Marianne was taken on by Postmistress Khan as a charity case and became the secret success story of the post office. After passing her A-levels in evening school, Marianne now goes to evening college and dreams of becoming a clever writer, but feels she lacks the wit and cleverness of Lady Susan to do so. Marianne tends to get lost in romantic daydreams and would love to meet a film star in the park, preferably a single one. While she's still waiting for this moment to happen, she delights in the letters, especially the part about love and marriage. Cecily, my dear, did you find something? Oh, and a wonderful good morning to you too, Patricia. Yes, I am very well, thank you. How are you? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, how are you? I'm well, we're all well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, I can't believe I actually did this, but I look in the mailbag and I actually found a letter from her. I really don't think we should be doing this, though. I mean, I don't give a flying flamingo about that woman, but aren't we supposed to, like, keep secrecy? Of course, but aren't we also the forgotten ones, the ones that nobody cares about? Haven't you said so repeatedly? Yeah. All right, all right. I'll do it. Fine. But why do you care so much anyway? No, 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 don't tell me. I really don't care. I don't know, I don't know. I'm just not into gossip, you know? But. Maybe my staff will be interested, or like, they are already interested, so. Oh, good idea. Gives them a break from being forgotten and left on our own. Oh, hello everyone, lovely Hi. to see you. Hello. I must say, I do not condone this. Oh, come on, Sandra, Sandra, don't be yeah, such a yeah. sport. None of us of course. Do. Well, Sandra. some of us, but not all of us. So here's the letter. It's from Lady Susan Vernon to Mr. Vernon. Her relatives here. Nice people. Like them, not her, obviously. Yeah, 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 I'm getting on with it. Fine. My dear brother, I can no longer refuse myself the pleasure of profiting by your kind invitation when we last parted of spending some weeks with you at Churchill. And therefore, if quite convenient to you and Mrs. Vernon to receive me at present, I shall hope within a few days to be introduced to a sister whom I have so long desired to be acquainted with. My kind friends here are most affectionately urgent with me to prolong my stay, but their hospitable and cheerful dispositions lead them too much into society for my present situation and state of mind. And I impatiently look forward to the hour when I shall be admitted into your delightful retirement. Oh, did you say retirement? Well, that's just music to my ears. It's just two years until mine, isn't it? Yes, yes, we all know. 
dreadfully polite until now, isn't she? Um, moving on. I long to be made known to your dear little children. Oh, she's an auntie, how nice. I long to be made known to your dear little children, in whose hearts I shall be very eager to secure an interest. I shall soon have need for all my fortitude, as I am on the point of separation from my own daughter. The long illness of her dear father prevented my paying her that attention which duty and affection equally dictated, and I have too much reason to fear that the governess to whose care I consigned her was unequal to the charge. I have therefore resolved on placing her at one of the best private schools in town, where I shall have an opportunity of leaving her myself in my way to you. Well, hold up. So she failed to take care of her daughter's emotional needs, and instead of making it up to her, she's just dumping her at a boarding school. Well, as far as I know, her daughter is a little bit extra. Oh, oh yes. she's a teenager. Don't be so hard. Moving on. I am determined, you see, not to be denied admittance at Churchill. It would indeed give me most painful sensations to know that it were not in your power to receive me. Hmm. Well, that's straightforward, isn't it? Well, that's a change of tone. Very insistent. Your most obliged and affectionate sister, Susan Vernon. So, there you have it. Oh, goody, goody, won't we have fun with that? Well, I'd be... She has some nerve, that one, inviting herself into people's houses like that. Well, don't you understand? She's not just going to bury herself somewhere in the countryside without another word. There will be more. Oh, I have got to go and tell the others. Right. Well, you all seem to know that Susan character. Should I know her? She is rather famous in the tabloids, isn't she? Cecily, I've got one too. Helen just gave it to me. Oh, great. It's from Lady Susan to Alicia Johnson. That's her best friend. I read that in the papers. Oh, I'm so excited. Langford. You were mistaken, my dear Alicia, in supposing me fixed at this place for the rest of the winter. It grieves me to say how greatly you are mistaken, for I have seldom spent three months more agreeably than those which have just flown away. At present, nothing goes smoothly. Well, I dare say, what with the scandal and everything. It's her own fault, isn't it? Well, well. The females of the family are united against me. You foretold how it would be when I first came to Langford, and mannering is so uncommonly pleasing that I was not without apprehensions for myself. I remember saying to myself as I drove to the house, I like this man, pray heaven no harm comes of it. What harm came ever from a man, right? This woman. We'll see. But I was determined to be discreet, to bear in mind my being only four months a widow, and to be as quiet as possible. And I have been so, my dear creature. I have admitted no one's attentions but mannerings. I have avoided all general flirtation, whatever. <laughs> well, right. at my time there just used to be flirtation, and no flirtation, no general flirtation. <laughs> you shouldn't right. be generally flirting anyway. She should be taking care of her daughter. Oh, yes. I have distinguished no creature besides of all the numbers resorting hither except Sir James Martin, on whom I bestowed a little notice in order to detach him from Miss Mannering. But if the world could know my motive there, they would honour me. I have been called an unkind mother. I didn't know that. By who? Who calls her? Who's that? But... It was the sacred impulse of maternal affection. It was the advantage of my daughter that led me on. And if that daughter were not the greatest simpleton on earth. Oh, she did not. How can she say that to her it's daughter? Not to say, is it? I have really? words. Sorry, everyone, that's what it says. I might have been rewarded for my exertions as I ought. Sir James did make proposals to me for Frederica. That would be the daughter, I suppose. Okay. 
But Frederica, who was going to be the torment of my life. Oh. <laughs> the wow. torment is very hard words. Chose to set herself so violently against the match that I thought it better to lay aside the scheme for the present. Good for I have more than once repented that I did not marry him myself. And were he but one degree less contemptibly weak, I certainly should. But I must own myself rather romantic in that respect, and that riches only will not satisfy me. Well, the lady sure knows what she wants. Well, I have found that riches rarely satisfy one in life. There must be other things, mustn't there? Certainly, I'm sure you're correct. It certainly doesn't hurt. Well. Anyway, uh, where was I? Yes, the event of all this is very provoking. Sir James is gone, Maria highly incensed, and Mrs. Mannering insupportably jealous. So jealous, in short, and so enraged against me, that in the fury of her temper I should not be surprised at her appealing to her guardian, if she had the liberty of addressing him. But there your husband stands my friend, and the kindest, most amiable action of his life was his throwing her off forever on her marriage. Keep up his resentment, therefore I charge you. We are now in a sad state. No house was ever more altered. The whole party are at war, and Mannering scarcely dares speak to me. It is time for me to be gone. That indeed. I have therefore determined on leaving them, and shall spend, I hope, a comfortable day with you in town within this week. If I am as little in favour with Mr. Johnson as ever, you must come to me at 10 Wigmer Street, but I hope this may not be the case, for as Mr. Johnson, with all his faults, is a man to whom that great word respectable is always given, and I am known to be so intimate with his wife, his slighting me has an awkward look. I take London in my way to that insupportable spot, a country village, for I am really going to Churchill. Well, what's so bad about Churchill? It's a lovely spot. Forgive me, my dear friend, it is my last resource. Were there another place in England open to me, I would prefer it. Charles Vernon is my aversion. Oh, that's her own brother, isn't it? Uh, actually, it's her brother-in-law. Ah. And I am afraid no. of his wife. At Churchill, however, I must remain till I have something better in view. My young lady accompanies me to town, where I shall deposit her under the care of Miss Summers in Wigmer Street, till she becomes a little more reasonable. Deposit her like a garbage bin? And then she's talking about her daughter becoming more reasonable? That daughter is better off without that bitch. Language, language. Helen. What's your language? Language? Oh, let's calm down, everyone, right? She will make good connections there, as the girls are all of the best families. The price is immense and much beyond what I can ever attempt to pay. Adieu. I will send you a line as soon as I arrive in town. Yours ever, Susan Vernon. This is going to be brilliant. Cecily, dear, do tell the rest of your staff to watch out for those letters. We mustn't miss one single letter. Patricia, you cannot mean to continue this scheme. Oh, this is against all our rules. I must say, I do not condone this. Oh, come on, everyone. Yes, I also do not condone this. But I won't forbid it either. Just make sure you do not tell a soul outside the office. Got that? Zip. Lips are sealed. Oh, goody, goody, you will not regret this. Bye, Cecily, love. Give my best to your staff and make sure to call me the minute you have a new letter. Bye. 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 So regret this. So regret technology.